Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I'm very delighted to be here, to be, in, to be invited by ARC, um, and because ARC have been an organisation we've worked with very closely in terms of getting the views of children and young people um, in a lot of our work. So it's great to be invited by them. And also we've worked a lot with the Centre for Children's Rights here at Queen's University, and I find that partnership invalu invaluable. So a lot of the work I'll be talking about has been done um, in partnership with both ARC and the Centre for, for Children's Rights here. So for me it is, I'm a very practical person um, and I suppose over time my understanding of how children's rights um, applies and how, what, what use it is really um, to people such as myself has developed. Um, and if it's not practical, if it doesn't make a difference, it's not worth having as far as I'm concerned. I think that the UNCRC makes a huge difference to um, children's lives and it makes a huge difference to the work that we do. And I just want to say a little bit about that if I can get this to work. Uh -huh. So we were established in 2004 um, and embedded in our legislation is the UNCRC specifically and children's rights more generally. Our aim is to safeguard and promote the rights and best interests of children and young persons and we're required in our legislation to have regard to both the importance of the role of parents and the relevant provisions of the UNCRC. And I could talk to you a lot about our, our duties and our powers, but to summarise, our role is to engage with children and young people and other stakeholders, scrutinise government's delivery, advise on government's delivery for children and young people, and challenge where necessary, using our powers. So, uh, in preparing for this, I was thinking, what is the difference that a rights-based a rights -based approach makes? And I didn't refer to other... Uh, to other references or to other papers, I just thought to myself, what difference in a day-to-day -day basis does the UNCRC make to our work? It is a reference, a set of internationally agreed minimum standards, um, and they were set out so they'd be achievable by all states. It helps with the scrutiny advice from a committee of international export, uh, experts. Um, there's a reporting procedure, which we all know about. There's general comments, including other observations, which help clarify best practice, and we use those on a daily basis. It's about moving beyond this charitable approach to see children as right holder, rights holders and to put obligations on governments as duty bearers. So it's not optional, it's not down to the whim of governments. Um, it changes the power balance there in terms of empowering children um, who are disenfranchised by our political system. And it helps to embrace, address those imbalances. It's a legal requirement. There is a requirement with the UNCRC onto a statutory footing, um, which we don't yet have in the UK. It's about all rights for all children, and we call this the non-discrimination um, article. So it's as much about the angry teenager as it is about the cute toddler, as it is about the refugee child, the Roma child, the poor child, the disabled child. It's every right applies to every child in the UNCRC. It has a focus on getting the processes right, which I think is one of the most useful things about the UNCRC. Um, and it, it contains measures for implementation. So it's the how things should be delivered, not just the what of the articles, but it's the how do we deliver for children and young people. It has a focus on making children's best interests a priority, which helps to bring visibility to children. Um, and we would find that quite often children are hidden in government policy. They look at communities or they look at families, but they don't look at children's needs necessarily within those communities or families. And one example with that, of that would be within welfare reform and the new conditionality clauses that are being put on parents. We've had conversations with um, a DSD, a social security agency, to say, we understand you have a policy to try and make sure government or parents are um, taking up their opportunities to work. Um, but the child has needs and you have to meet those needs irregardless of what the parent does. So it's about bringing children, making children visible, best interest is about bringing, making children visible within the family and within the communities. It's also about progressive realisation and non-regression um, in relation to socioeconomic rights. And there's a recognition that different states are in different stages of development, have different resources available to them. And this issue of the maximum extent maximum extent available is very important. So whenever the UNC was written into our legislation, all of these um, tools and these principles were also written in 
to how we work. So that's the reporting cycle. I'll not talk through it. I think most of us know about it. I, I coloured in green really where we are currently. We're waiting to get the list of issues back from the committee. Um, and red is really where we spend the majority of our time. The majority of our time is spent trying to get the implementation of the concluding observations and of the UNCRC rights. I thought I'd, I'd put in a couple of slides in relation to what we've highlighted um, in our report uh, to the committee. Um, we worked together with the other three commissioners, the other three children's commissioners across the UK to identify the key areas um, that we believe the committee needs to be aware of across the UK affecting children. And the periodic report is, is good to make you focus on uh, what are the key issues. And we're quite nervous coming together to, uh, the, the four offices coming together to see if we could crack this, if we could come up with four or five areas that we felt were critical across the UK. And it was unanimous. Um, we had set aside a morning to debate it, and we ran through, each ran three or four or five. And these were, these were it, really. Um, the impact of austerity on children child poverty, human rights settlement, or general measures more generally, but human rights settlement in particular in relation to the Human Rights Act, mental health, mental health services, and child sexual exploitation. So those are the five areas across the UK that we felt needed to be raised. Then in relation to Northern Ireland, we also had the opportunity to have more specific areas, um, and these are some of the areas, oops, uh, that we raised whenever, particularly whenever we were in front of the committee um, two weeks ago. So we're able to identify some of the key, the key issues. And those are the what. What needs to be changed for children? But the UNCRC provides a really useful structure. We do use it on a day-to-day -day basis. It is our tool for providing advice to government, scrutinizing what government does. And this is the way we apply it. Whenever there's an issue, um, there's a policy being developed or a piece of legislation, or if we're getting research conducted on a certain, or conducting research in a certain area, we look at the UNCRC articles, which articles apply. We look at the general comments to see where have the committee gone into more detail and provided more guidance in relation to these articles. And they looked at the including observations as well to see what the committee has said most recently in relation to these issues. And then there's other standards at times as well that we're able to draw upon. I also mentioned the UNCRPD and Assessor. There are other, obviously other um, UN conventions that we, we draw on. We find the general principles, the guiding principles, very useful. Um, and even if we're not providing detailed advice to government, we would tend to highlight those um, because I think uh, they are a good basic start for, for, for um, departments and for government to look and think about how to implement the UNCRC. We have focused a lot in the Commission on general measures of implementation, um, and this is the how we deliver for children and young people. Um, general Comment 5 is a really useful comment, um, and I know that OFM, DFM have recently been looking at it and finding it very useful when they're thinking about developing the children's strategy as well. One of the things, we had a workshop, sort of a starting, starting conversation around um, the new children's strategy that's been being developed, and there was a lot of conversation around how it needed to be rights-based, the new children's strategy had to be rights-based. And at one point, um, the, uh, the lead official who was leading on developing the children's strategy said, could anyone just articulate what difference the right-based approach would make? And um, there was a bit of a silence, and um, we, a few kind of attempts to articulate it, and, I realise going away that we talk a lot about it, but we need to be very clear that it's actually a very useful tool. And there are very practical things that make something a rights-based approach. General Comment 5 is, is very useful that way, and I know that June went off and read it and felt that was a very useful explanation for what a rights-based approach to developing a children's strategy would look like. So some of the general measures of implementation um, then are the incorporation of the UNCRC into domestic legislation. This is something that would make a real difference to children and young people if we could um, if we could, uh, if we had the UNCRC in law. The comprehensive national strategy, which is our children and young people's strategy. The coordination of implementation. We know currently there's the Children's Services Cooperation Bill going through the Assembly, which we feel will make a huge difference, um, or potentially can make a huge difference in um, ensuring that government departments are joining up in, how, in the way they deliver for children and young people. 
monitoring and child rights impact assessments, um, data collection and indicators, and um, there's a real focus on disaggregated data to make sure that we're able to look at the discrimination, um, non-discrimination, um, making children visible in budgets, training a capacity building in relation to children's rights, independent human rights institutions and for children, including children's commissioners, and raising awareness of the UNCRC. So these are the duties on states um, whenever we're looking at children's rights um, to implement children's rights. As I said, we've focused a lot on our general measures work um, because certainly after uh, Certainly after a number of years, we look back at our advice on government and we realise we've given advice on a very wide range of issues um, and made a lot of different points, but there were key themes that were coming through again and again. And these tended to be around the how, the how to deliver for children. Um, so some of the work that we have done and we continue to do is around advising children's strategy and design implementation, advice on participation mechanisms and on the development of children's rights indicators. Um, and We've worked a lot with the Centre for Children's Rights in relation to um, our review of the barriers to, to government delivery for children. And we commissioned a report back in 2011 where they examined the development and delivery of policies and strategies for children. And while there were some positive examples, they found considerable delays, lack of coordination, lack of follow through from strategy aims to delivery in the ground, lack of disaggregated data, little knowledge of children's rights, little meaningful engagement with children and young people in designing or implementing strategies. So that's really been a lot of the focus of our work, trying to help government to deliver more effectively for children and young people. And I'll maybe just mention um, one of the other areas that we're focused on then has been the scrutiny of spending on children. Um, and we recently um, published a report where we mapped, um, Dartington Social Research Unit mapped out the funding on children's services, um, uh, public spending on, on children's services across Northern Ireland, which is a really useful report, very practical report, and we're hoping to use that in the future to um, both assess against need and also map over time um, where the money's going, basically. So um, if anyone's interested in joining us in the Children's Budgeting Working Group on that issue, we'd like to hear from you. So some of the opportunities and challenges um, generally now in relation to children's rights are um, in relation to the deepening austerity. And I think that's why the budget analysis is important. We need to know what's being spent. We need to know where it's going um, and when, when cuts are being made and how that's impacting on children. An issue is that rights do remain optional um, because it's not in domestic legislation. It's dependent on personalities. So we're fortunate at the moment that we do have officials that are um, very committed to children's rights and are attempting to embed the new children's strategy in children's rights and also some of the special advisors and ministers. But um, it's not good enough that it's down to individuals deciding or individuals' commitment. We do need to see the full incorporation of the UNCRC into domestic legislation for it really to become meaningful. We also need to see the third optional protocol in relation to individual complaints um, being signed up to by the UK government. It's a possibility that might be something we see movement on through this reporting process. There needs to be more focus on the measures of implementation. Um, at the moment, we don't have a central mechanism for supporting participation of children and young people. There's a lack of training and awareness for children's rights across government. Child rights impact assessments are rarely carried out. Um, and there have been issues um, back in 2007 and in 2012 or 13, we provided reports to the government. We're required through our legislation to report to government on where there may be issues with our legislation. And um, we provided a report um, in relation to our independence, saying that we should be answerable to the assembly and not to government in relation to what we're calling du um, duplication causes in our legislation. We look like we have a lot of powers, but in reality, we're not able to use them because of these duplication clauses. And then also in relation to victim status, that we can't take legal cases in our own name. Um, and so we provided twice now these reports to government and they haven't been responded to. And for us, we feel that's a, a, a real limitation um, and a real impact. I thought I'd finish with opportunities. Um, the development of the new children and young people strategy is a real opportunity. And also Wolf and DFM have been de developing child rights indicators. And we've got to give them credit for that because not very many countries around the world have, tried, have attempted this. 
There is also a focus on outcomes. We had found, um, or certainly the barriers report had found, that where there were um, objectives put into strategies, they didn't deliver outcomes on the ground for children. And government is really focusing now on outcomes, which is a positive thing. The Children's Service Cooperation Bill, I've also mentioned as a, as a positive development. And I think um, the forthcoming include observations could be very useful as well. I understand that um, a large number of questions that were raised in the pre-sessional hearing two weeks ago and were specifically for Northern Ireland and the committee was very concerned about particular issues in relation to Northern Ireland. And also, um, having just published this report, I feel quite positive that we have a mechanism now that we can hopefully scrutinise budgets for children more closely. So that's my um, presentation. Um, I believe that rights do provide a very practical and valuable mechanism for holding governments to account in delivering for vulnerable and disenfranchised groups such as children. Um, who have specific needs linked with their particular circumstances. I think it would be very difficult to do my job if it wasn't, if we didn't have the UNCRC. I think it's a very practical mechanism and a very practical way of delivering for children. A rights-based approach helps identify problems in government delivery for children and provides a legal basis and a practical basis for addressing these. We have a long way to go, but I hope that my presentation has shown that we have reasons to be optimistic. <laughs>